Hello, my dear students. Welcome back once again to Classroom TV. Do visit our website classroomtv.in and also you may download the Classroom TV app on your Android mobile phones to access exhaustive video content matched to your curriculum in the subjects of mathematics, physics, chemistry, English, biology, social studies plus IIT and NEET foundation across state and CBSE boards for standards 6th to 10th at extremely affordable rates. Learning on the move was never so easy and was never so affordable. To continue, we will now see, discuss in this and in coming episodes an important lesson. Now when you look at this picture, immediately what strikes to you? The word agriculture. You can see a farmer plowing and here transplantation going on, harvesting, here you can see a cotton crop, sunflower and sugar cane. So needless to say, we are going to discuss and in this picture you can see this tractor and all these things. We are going to discuss the chapter agriculture, a very important chapter in your social studies lessons. In this chapter we are going to discuss types of farming. So we have primitive subsistence farming, intensive subsistence farming, then we have commercial farming, then we are going to discuss about cropping pattern and seasons, Rabi, Kharif and Zaid crops. Then under major crops we are going to discuss about rice, wheat, millets, maize, pulses and food crops which are other than grains. We are going to also learn about what? Sugar cane, oil seeds, tea and coffee, horticulture crops and under non-food crops we are going to learn about rubber, fiber crops, cotton and jute and technological and institutional reforms plus contribution of agriculture to the national economy employment and output and impact of globalization on agriculture and finally about Bhutan movement. All these topics we are going to learn in this and in the coming episodes. Now let us see one by one. Introduction part. Here India is an agriculturally important country. For India agriculture is very important. A major share of our economy is dependent on agriculture. Two thirds of its population is engaged in agricultural activities. Need not necessarily mean the farming, but agriculture and its allied activities. It is a primary activity which produces most of the food that we consume. Primary activity. We already know about what secondary and tertiary activities are. Secondary is processing whatever is in the primary activity, processing it is in the secondary activity and the tertiary activity we do the marketing, service, all these things we consider under tertiary activities. So it is a primary activity which produces most of the food that we consume. A popular quote is no farmer, no food also you see across many holdings. Besides food grains, it also produces raw material for various industries. Yes, the cotton, the jute bags, many other products, the what we call the milk products, all these things, see your cheese or butter or everything, what not. They are all dependent on agriculture. Moreover, some agricultural products like tea, coffee, spices, etc. are also exported. We not only produce them, we also export them because some of the coffee and tea that is produced in India is of finest quality. We have seen where some of the 1 kg of tea, I am told it is being sold in Delhi airport which costs about 10 to 12 lakhs 1 kilogram of tea 
exotic tea. Of course, spiced up with very exquisite spices. So, we do export some exclusive tea and coffee also spices. In fact, India was the was famous for its spices trade and that is one of the reasons why they wanted, they discovered a sea route to India from Europe. Vasco de Gama came via Cape of Good Hope to reach to India, attracted by the money they would make by selling spices and gold. Some of the industries based on agricultural raw metals are textile industry, food processing, dairy processing, sugar industry, vegetable oil industry, tea, coffee, leather industry, etc. All these things. Now, we can, if we see the example of textile industry, in this flow chart, what you see? The cotton, the first slide we saw the picture, that is ginning is done, converted into yarn and then spinning, weaving and then dyeing and then ultimately we get our garments. But what is the raw material? The source is again our cotton here, which again falls under agricultural activity, the primary activity. So, not only this, we have textile food processing. If we, now, we get all packed foods, snacks, your cookies and biscuits, where do they get? Wheat from wheat, processed. Your cheese, we get from milk, butter again from milk, yogurt, all these things and your sugar industries, we get different kinds of sweets, sugar again from sugar cane. Vegetable oils, groundnut oil or your olive oil or mustard oil, rapeseed oil, linseed oil, castor oil for lubricants, all these things are again dependent on agriculture. So, they are all secondary activities. So, the primary activity is production of agricultural activity vis a vis this we are discussing. And we will see now the types of farming. Agriculture is an age old economic activity in our country from times immemorial also in the if you read the book, history books you see a reference to agriculture. The primitive implements also, so these are some of the primitive implements used by our forefathers. So, it is an age old activity. Over the years, cultivation methods have changed significantly depending upon the characteristics of a physical environment, technological know-how and socio-cultural practices. Physical environment, say new methods are being implemented. Now, for example, if cultivation needs to be done on the hilly regions, one methodology for harvesting or for plowing, different methods are involved. And if it is a plain land, one sort of farming is resorted to. So, the physical environment and technological know-how is important and social cultural practices. Now, if you look at these pictures, I have changed significantly. In this we see for removing the weed, de-weeding, the tractors are used and for watering the plants, sprinklers are used. And for harvesting, we say giant harvesters, wherein this machine cuts the crop and then directly you get the grain as an end product. There is no need to, earlier days they used to be harvested and then they used to do threshing and then winnowing, all these things ultimately they used to do, lead into losses and expensive manpower. Technologically, we are much, much, much better placed. Of course, the negative effect is it also affects the livelihood of people because the amount of work what this machine does in one hour is more than equal to some 500,000 people in, an hour, in, uh, in 4 or 5 days. This does within a couple of hours. Humans cannot beat the machines vis-a-vis -vis the output, but to keep the costs down, these are being used.
it varies the farming varies from subsistence to commercial type. Subsistence, what is subsistence? Bear for living expenses, for living the bare requirement, the minimum requirement for a family to sustain is what we call it as subsistence farming and commercial farming in addition to what that is kept aside for feeding the family and meeting expenses, whatever is sold is what is a commercial deal, a commercial type. At present, the following farming systems are practiced in different parts of India. What are they? Simple subsistence farming where the land holding is small. The landowner cultivates the land and whatever produce the food grains and other oil seeds, whatever he grows, it is meant for sustaining the family living. And the next is intensive subsistence farming. So, within the limited amount of land, they put more inputs to extract a better package. Let us learn about simple subsistence farming. Such farming is practiced to meet the needs of the family. Practiced on small patches of land with the help of primitive tools like hoe, dow and digging sticks through family or community labor. Hoe, dow and digging sticks, these are used and who through a family or community labor, all the members of the family struggle, work on the land to till, to sow seeds, water them, harvest them, separate the grain and then again separate the chaff, remove the husk to get the final grain to be eaten. Of course, they sell something and then with that money what they buy other necessities for the food and other living expenses. So, there are primitive methods, these are used. Digging sticks, you can see this lady digging the land with the help of this digging stick. Depends upon, then simple substance depends upon monsoon, natural fertility of the soil and suitability of other environmental conditions for the crops grown. Now, for example, in this picture you can see this lady. Apparently, she is pretty poor. She cannot afford to have a bore well. There is no irrigation for that in the particular, for the particular patch of land. She is dependent on what? Rain. When it rains and depending upon the soil fertility, she will sow that crop which yields better. Environmental factors also play a role in the type of crop that is chosen to be sown. Climate with large number of days with sunshine and fertile soils permit growing of more than one crop annually on the same plot and in case this patch of land has good rainfall, she can grow multiple crops. But again, they are dependent on the Mad on the mercy of and the vagaries of nature affect the livelihood. It is and here we have in this we have a, it is a slash and burn agriculture. What is this? Here a patch of land, the trees are cut, the burnt after allowing them to dry, they are burnt and that land is ploughed. Farmers clear a patch of land and produce cereals and other food crops to sustain their family here. They cut and then once they burn, they plough, this ash also goes into the soil. What is it used for? For growing cereals and other food crops to sustain their family. <coughs> For this, they resort to all these things. Why? Because they do not have their own land, they do not have capacity to purchase land and they do not have money to put fertilizers and other 
needed inputs. So what they do? They cut trees, burn them, allow the after one round of crop, one cycle of crop, after the crop is grown, they leave this land and go and cut at some other place and allowing this patch of land to rejuvenate or improve its fertility. Then again they come back and cultivate this piece of land. When the soil fertility decreases, the farmers shift and clear a fresh patch of land for cultivation. It is called shifting cultivation. This type of shifting allows nature to replenish the fertility of soil through natural process, replenish. So, when the nutrients in the first crop, it will be very good yield. In the second batch, the yield comes down a little because they are not giving any additional inputs. They are purely dependent on the nature to replenish the nutrients in the soil. So, after two or three crops, when the yield starts falling, they leave this patch of land and go elsewhere and again resort to same this clearing and burning and then again cultivating. Land productivity in this type of agriculture is low as the farmer does not use fertilizers and other modern inputs, does not use. At the most he may give them some manure, cattle dung if they have. Otherwise, he can't afford to. So, there is no, like because he can't afford to put his fertilizers, other natural, other inputs, the yield obviously goes down after a few seasons. It is known by different names in different parts of country. This shifting cultivation has different names in different regions. It is called Jhum in northeastern states like Assam, Meghalaya, Mizoram and Nagaland. In these parts of northeastern states, it is called as Jhum. And in Manipur, it is called Pamlao. And in Bastar district of Chhattisgarh and Andaman Nicobar, it is called Deepa. It is called Deepa. It is all one and the same, but the name what the farmers give in their regions are different. And in Bewad or Dahia, in Madhya Pradesh, it is called Bewad or Dahia. And in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, it is called Podu or Penda, Podu Bhumulu, what they say. Then Pama Dabi or Koman or Bringa in Odisha, Kumari in Western Ghats, then it is also called Walre or Waltre in Southeastern Rajasthan, Khil in Himalayan Belt, Kruva in Jharkhand, then Milpa in Mexico and Central America, even in those countries have this shifting cultivation. And Conuco in Venezuela and Roca in Brazil, Masole in Central Africa, Ladang in Indonesia and Re in Vietnam. So depending on the region where this is practiced, the shifting cultivation has its own name. My dear students, do learn all these names and regions. We don't know when they will be useful. And what do they grow? Rice, maize, millet, sesame, cucumber, pumpkin, melon, tapioca, cotton, banana, ginger, turmeric, etc. are grown in this cultivation. The shifting cultivation, all these types have grown and I am going to show all these, you know, rice, maize, millet, sesame, cucumber, pumpkin, melon and tapioca the roots and what do you get from them? This I am sure everybody knows, Sabudana. From these roots, they are extracted, processed and then what you get this round white grains. When these are, this is a, some snack is prepared, sweet dishes are prepared, 
kheer or even this upma sort of thing is prepared. And when somebody is sick also, they give the sabadana food. This of course is tapioca and ginger and turmeric, turmeric roots. These are grown in this shifting cultivation. We learn now intensive subsistence farming. That was only subsistence, simple subsistence, and now we are going to discuss about intensive subsistence farming. This type of farming is practiced in areas of high population pressure of land. When the population density is high and the amount of cultivable land is not that much, it results in an intense pressure on the limited amount of land that can be cultivated so that multiple crops are grown to get a better output. It is labor intensive farming where high doses of biochemical inputs and irrigation are used for obtaining higher production. More input goes into the soil, more fertilizers, more manure, so that the crop that you get, you get and then biochemical inputs. Now even the, we have this high yielding variety of grains seeds are high yielding varieties. So per plant the number of seeds that grow are high. Scientists have developed this high yielding variety soils, uh, seeds. Why? Because the land is limited. If the particular limited piece of land they want to get a better yield, what to do? They also have developed this pesticide resistant crops also. because. Even the, when the attack of pesticides attack these crops, the whole crop is lost. So to prevent that, pesticide resistant seeds are developed, what we call it as biochemical inputs. Tamil Nadu, Kerala and also irrigation and more irrigation. So as soon after rainy season crop is done, after the crop is harvested, give a break and then sow again and support with irrigation facility. So in, in the very good irrigated areas, people take out three crops, of course different varieties but they get three crops per annum. So that is what you call it as intensive subsistence farming. Tamil Nadu, Kerala, West Bengal and coastal area Andhra Pradesh have adopted this for paddy cultivation while Haryana, Western Uttar Pradesh and Punjab grow oil seeds, soya bean, pulses, millets, maize and wheat in this intensive substance farming. Though the right of inheritance leading to the division of land among successive generations has rendered land holding size uneconomical, the farmers continue to take maximum output from the limited land in the absence of alternative source of livelihood. This is an important issue, a right of inheritance. If you look at this picture, what do you inherit? The land holding which belongs to a family. Let us say a family has, apart from father and mother, there are four brothers and let us say two sisters. Depending on now of course even girls also have equal right in the property. Now when the father was cultivating, this man, when the head of the family is cultivating, he would have cultivated this entire piece of land. this entire piece of land he must have cultivated. But when the, a partition takes place or after the father dies, now there is no father, he has died, then what happens? These four sons and two daughters have their own families. 
this piece of land is made into six pieces. What happens? Each one gets a smaller holding. But again, remember, in this particular family, there were 2 plus 4 plus 2, 6. Total, 8 people were there in this family. Father, mother, plus 2 boys and 4 boys and 2 sisters. 6 plus 2, 8 people were there in the family. And when these people get married, even each boy, each son will have again his own family. Let us say he has two children, every family has into two is equal to, they have eight children in their families and husband and wife, eight adults plus again two into two, again another four here. So total 20 people, the population, the number of people surviving in this land has grown into 20 people, but each family has again four to five people, whereas the land holding has shrunk because every son gets a right in this land. When you divide a big piece of cake, when you go to attend somebody's birthday party, the cake, if more number of people are there, they cut the cake into more smaller pieces. Do you feel happy when you eat the small piece of cake? No. You would like to eat some more, but there is no availability. The, the cake is not available because the host has made smaller pieces and distributed to all the guests. Then what happens? Of course, cake, you can't do anything, you can just thank you and say, go out of the house. But here, because it's a land, what they do is, they give more inputs on this land. Now, if you look at this picture, this was fragmented. Once upon a time, this whole picture must have belonged to one family. Now, you see different crops, different sizes of crop, plot pieces. different plot pieces because of different owners, cousins. Imagine this land holding must have been say about 100 years ago it must have been between four brothers. Then four, those four brothers have again let us say two children at least each. Two and then their grandchildren and then great grandchildren. So the land holding size keeps on reducing. And let us say on this small piece of land if a family wants to survive simple subsistence farming is not sufficient, then they resort to intensive subsistence farming because they want to get maximum because water is available, let us say. And they are fairly affordable, they can put, they can put more pests, more fertilizers and from this piece of land, they try to extract the maximum. This is what is called as intensive subsistence farming. It's subsistence, again the first picture, but intensive subsistence farming to generate the maximum yield. Thus, there is enormous pressure on agricultural land. So, in this particular piece of land, if you put three crops, what about the nutrients? Whether the soil can sustain this onslaught in our quest or in our greed, whatever you call it, to get more yield. You plow again and again, put some more in. There is no strength. There is not much of a strength left in this piece of land or in any piece of land. This picture I have taken for you to understand the fragmented holdings or right of inheritance, how it has fragmented the land. That is why some countries adopt this cooperative farming. If a single person wants to cultivate this piece of land, it is quite expensive. For example, you call a, a daily wager, you pay him 500 rupees to plow this land. But this piece of land, he will plow it in half day and then remaining day he sits idle. Not much work can be extracted. But if, if he is asked to plow these two pieces of land, he will take it full day. So that 500, if it is spent on two pieces of land, it is a viable alternative. 
and let us say there should be a security man for this, a guard, a watch, someone to watch on this one. Sitting here, he can watch the entire land, but if everybody appoints one, one person as a security guard for their piece of land, there will be more salary. But here if all of them come together in a spirit of cooperation and then cultivate or secure, uh, take turns in watching, protecting the land, protecting the crop and share the benefits of this crop, it is an ideal situation and everybody would be benefited mutually. Then we will see the commercial farming. The main characteristic of this type of farming is the use of higher doses of modern inputs that is high yielding variety HYV, high yielding variety seeds, chemical fertilizers, insecticides and pesticides in order to obtain higher productivity. Now if you look at this you see that these plants full of grain, these are called high yielding varieties and now we can see this farmer giving to the crop fertilizers, urea or whatever the potash, nitrogen, whatever it is and then here he is spraying pesticides to kill any infections, thereby protecting. So number one, he is sowing high yielding variety of seeds where the yield would be more, the number of grains per stock are more. Then he is also giving them fertilizers and also protecting them with the help of pesticides. So the yield is more. In order to obtain a higher productivity, the aim is for a higher productivity. The degree of commercialization of agriculture varies from one region to another. How much you commercialize, it varies from place to place. For example, rice is a commercial crop. What is the commercial crop? Which is cultivated for profits in Haryana and Punjab because rice is not their staple diet, they depend on wheat, wheat or bajra, wheat mostly. But in Odisha, it is subsistence crop, they depend on their staple diet is rice. South India, for South India, some of the areas they grow wheat. It is a commercial crop for them, whereas rice is a staple diet, subsistence crop. So it depends on the region where it is grown. Now let us say Punjab has good water potential. If the farmer feels there that even though he may not eat rice, he is fond of eating wheat or wheat products, he feels that rice fetches a better price, he will sow rice paddy because he can make a good amount of money. So that is a commercial activity for him. Whereas same case in the Orissa, in case of Odisha, Andhra Pradesh or Telangana or any South Indian state, it is mostly a subsistence crop. Plantation is also a type of commercial farming wherein a single crop is grown on a large area. Commercial plantation, banana plantation, rubber plantation where where a single crop is grown on a large area. Bananas we get throughout the year and in some of the hotels they serve with banana leaves. Banana is one such fruit where it is available throughout the year. They cut them when they are semi ripe, store them, ripen them and they bring them into market. And these, these bananas, they are called plantation crops. The water potential is good, they are grown for a longer duration of time and in large extents of land. The plantation has an interface of agriculture and industry. It has both industrial use also. See if you take example of rubber, it has industrial use also. Plantations cover large tracts of land using capital intensive inputs with the help of migrant laborers. Plantations cover large tracts of land. We know the story of Indians being transported or 
bonded laborer taken by the britishers best example is from india they traveled to sri lanka or malaysia fiji maldives you can see people of indian origin working there they went there to work in plantation crops rubber banana plant whatever it is they are migrant labor because they didn't get much of opportunities if you read history the, the laborers who went to fiji or from are the poorer section of the people who wanted to avoid the caste discrimination they came across in some extremely caste sensitive or caste conscious areas of the nation to avoid this persecution they went far as migrant laborers and now of course after four five generations they have become well they have become pretty rich but initially when they went as migrant laborers they were put to work in plantations any plantation in commercial farming crops are grown and animals are reared for sale in market sheep rearing cattle breeding all these things we see all the produce is used as raw material in respective industries in india tea coffee rubber sugarcane banana etc are important plantation crops commercial farming now if you look here it's a labor intensive industry tea that pluck the leaves grade them dry them pack them it's a labor intensive it's a tree plantation coffee plantation and the rubber plantation in this rubber plantation that the tree barks are cut and allow the juice to fall into the small pots and then they are collected and then processed tea in assam and north bengal coffee in karnataka are some of the important plantation crops grown in these states assam and north bengal are famous for coffee sorry tea and coffee in karnataka are some of the important plantation crops grown in these states and kerala of course it is rubber since the production is ma- mainly for market a well developed network of transport and communication connecting the plantation areas processing industries and markets plays an important role in the development of plantation obviously when there is a good network of market also important the lot of tea is collected or coffee seeds are grown but it has to reach out to customers the the people who have planted these should get make money obviously a market for them is to be will be developed whole network is good transportation is good then only these things are planted with this we conclude this episode of the chapter agriculture and we'll continue the remaining in the coming episodes meanwhile do watch the video once again and read the lesson for a better understanding have a good day all the best